Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome. Hello again. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you're listening from and on whatever platform you're listening on. I greatly appreciate you spending some time with us. So today's topic is going to be focusing on being an effective assistant coach. And I think this is really important for a few reasons. I think it's important for younger or newer coaches to consider being an assistant coach and consider what that experience could teach you if that's something that you're interested in in going into coaching i think if you're a older coach or a veteran coach who's maybe a head coach i think this would be a good time to reflect on the way that you use your assistants if you have them or the way that you incorporate your freshman or jv coach or whatever you do in your program and then if you are an assistant coach to kind of just reflect and think about uh, the discussion we have here and see how it's similar how it's different and just sort of enjoy it in that way so to talk to us about uh, being an effective assistant coach. I'm very happy to be joined by Coach David Edwards. Coach, how are you today? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, thank you for joining us. I think this is a really good topic that that sometimes we get, uh, we don't don't spend enough time on about being an effective assistant coach and what that can look like and and how a really, really good assistant coach can strengthen and boost your program and, and get it to where it needs to be. So looking forward to this discussion. Now, uh, as we get started, what I like to do with all of my guests is I like to talk about your coaching journey, where basketball's taking you, where coaching's taking you, and where it is you're at right now. So, Coach, want to go ahead and uh, talk about your journey? Yeah, I, I would say that my journey is definitely, uh, I don't know, I guess unique in a lot of ways. Um, mm-hmm. When I was young, I was a soccer player, and I was like all in soccer. Um, I played soccer, I coached soccer. I ref soccer. Uh, I didn't know much about basketball at all. Um, And that took me all the way through high school. Never played basketball um, into college. Um, And in college, uh, I got the opportunity to become a head soccer coach, a head varsity soccer coach. So my junior and senior year, I I grew up in Pennsylvania. Uh, My junior and senior year, I was a head varsity soccer coach. When I graduated college, um, you know, Pennsylvania's Rust Belt and uh, teaching jobs are some of the most secure jobs up there. And uh, because I was a stipend position, it just didn't have a teaching position for me. So I started kind of doing a search uh, around the country. At that point, I really had no connection anywhere. And uh, I got really blessed to get a job uh, here in Austin, Texas, uh, which is a great place to live. And, uh, you know, it was a good job. Uh, and it was a middle school job at a private school. And uh, they said I had to coach a second sport. And I said, well, let me try basketball. I mean, how hard could that possibly be? Mm-hmm. And um, so my first year, uh, it became abundantly clear a couple things. Uh, first thing is that uh, I was a terrible basketball coach. I mean, I'm <laughs> god awful. Uh, and, and the second thing was that I really enjoyed coaching it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that started this journey for me in basketball coaching. Um, and that was 19 years ago. Um, and I said, I really want to be good at this. And uh, so I stayed at that school for five years. Uh, the last year, two years. Well, you know, the question I think you got to ask is, is who is the best? And I think you got to go to the best because the best are the ones that have mastered it. And those are the ones to learn from. So, of course, I started with John Wooden. um, And then I I read a quote in in a John Wooden book that said, without a doubt, the best basketball coach ever was Morgan Wooten. And I said, who the heck is Morgan Wooten? I started looking that up. And I realized that he was still running a basketball camp in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so my, uh, I guess my fourth year teaching, I just got, I, I had thrown an email their way. I said, I'd love to work your camp if I could. And, uh, and they, they accepted me, sight unseen, and I just got my car and drove up there. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, that was like the greatest education I've ever had uh, as, a, as a professional teacher. Um, I mean, he 
he was the best and you know i think will always be um and so i i spent four weeks up there that summer and then the next year spent another four weeks um and along that line kind of between those two uh his son joe Wooten, who's the head coach at bishop o'connell high school in arlington virginia uh i called him and i said look uh you know, i'm young i'm single i got no connections here in austin other than my job uh if i moved up to virginia could I volunteer in, in your program? Uh, I just wanted to learn from the wounds and he said, okay. And so um, that next year I moved up there and thankfully I got, I got a good teaching job at a different school and I spent a year at, at O'Connell uh, learning from one of the best uh, in Joe Wooten. And uh, I was way over my head. I mean, it was, it was yeah. unbelievable the level that that program was run at. It was run like a, a, a quality college program. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I just met my, uh, my now wife and she stayed in Austin. So after a year of that, uh, she said, probably ought to move back if we're going to do this thing. And so I did. And uh, I got a job uh, at an elementary school. And at that elementary school, um, I, I developed a, a program called Bulldog Basketball. Uh, which we t eventually turned into a nonprofit. Um, so I ran that for six years. And then I decided uh, I wanted to get back into high school ball. And so I volunteered at a high school uh, for a year. And then I got a top assistant position in another high school for a year. And then I ended up getting the job at Austin High, where I am currently. Um, and uh, I've been there for the last five years. I've had two head coaches. And... Uh, yeah, so I mean, along the way, there's a lot of other things, you know, camps and, and clinics and all that stuff, but uh, it's, it's been a unique way to get here, but uh, I think everything has uh, really prepared me for the role that I'm currently in. And, and the theme that I see kind of reoccurring is just, just that passion of just wanting to be involved and wanting to learn. You talked about when you first were starting to coach basketball, like it, it, it was something that you realize there's a huge learning curve too, but then you just sort of dove right into it and, and you wanted to learn as much as you could and you, were, you got, and that, that's the way that you do it. If you really want to learn, you find who the best people are, you go work camps, you go put yourselves out there. And I think you bring up a good point where at the time you, you were single and, and you didn't have kids or anything. So if you had the mobility like you did to just sort of go out and go for it, if you're really passionate about it. Absolutely. So. And I, and I do relate to the, the fact that you went from soccer to basketball. Uh, I know I, I was with basketball my whole life, but then I got asked to coach like volleyball and softball. And I was like, oh, how hard can this be? And, and the answer is hard. <laughs> the answer is oh, it is okay. difficult. Uh, I, I didn't put as much time in as, as you currently have with, with basketball. But, but yeah, there's so much that you can learn just from doing another sport and coaching another sport that you're not familiar with. It, it'll it'll teach you a lot. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So okay. you mentioned about the, uh, the nonprofit, you said, you said it started with bulldog basketball and then it's a nonprofit. And, and we talked a little bit off air about how you, you formed a club. You, you, you have an organization that you formed right now, which, which I think is great. Can, can you talk about, about this club, this organization and kind of the process that you went through and, and what made you ultimately decide to form it? Absolutely. So um, when I got to that elementary school, it was the first year of that school. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, in Northeast Austin, which is um, an area, a, a low SES area. Um, you know, we had 99% of our kids on free lunch. We didn't even talk about reduced lunch when it came to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, uh, and what we found was that a lot of the fourth and fifth grade boys in particular were having a hard time in class. Um, you know, they were rambunctious, they were having a hard time learning, uh, and there wasn't really um, something to connect them to the school. And as the leaders of the school, um, you know, we needed something. I'm coming from this unbelievable program at Bishop O'Connell, and I just have this passion for basketball. Um, and I said, let's get these kids together. They look talented. I, I was teaching PE, so I could see that they, I mean, they had athleticism. And... Um, I said, let's just put this thing together and, and put a team together and see what happens. And we put a team into a local uh, community league and we saw some success. The kids got hooked on it and then it just built and built and we turned it into a real program where it was like the entire school year. We practiced almost every day. 
Um, we, um, you know, we, our, our pillars of the program were academics, attitude, effort, and excellence. And that's one thing I'm going to talk about a lot. Yeah. Like, I think you have to have a foundation in everything you do because then it, there's no questions. Like, you know, um, if a kid is struggling in the classroom because of their choices, like academics is one of our pillars. Mm. You want to be in this program, you, you got to care about academics. Like, and they all know them they, and they were memorized, you know, <laughs> like we knew what we believed in. Um, and so, um, you know, and from there, we, we just built it. We had mandatory study tables. We had days in the library. We had tutoring sessions. Uh, we had teachers who were giving their time to work with these kids extra. They had uh, academic accountability marks that they had to meet every single week to just play in the games. Um, and after a couple of years, we turned it into a 501c3 um, and it, you know, nonprofit public charity. And uh, that helped with our donations. Uh, we took them on four trips, which are educational trips, uh, where they played in tournaments. They played in a tournament. We'd go do a college visit. We'd do something cultural. Um, you know, we would take them. We, one of the coolest things we did with them is uh, uh, we, we would teach them how to act in a, like a four-star restaurant. And then we would work with the manager and we would actually take them to like a four-star restaurant. Right. And, you know, there's a bunch of fourth and fifth grade kids that had never been to anything like that. They dressed up in shirts and ties and suits and we all went out. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's stuff that they still talk about. They've graduated high school and they still talk about this. Yeah. You know? and, and so, and then uh, now, uh, since I'm at the high school level, you know, the, to, the only way to really make that work was to be at the school. Uh, now that I'm at the high school level, you know, it's, we've just kind of been sitting on it. Um, and uh, with this COVID thing, with, the, with us being at home, I finally have had the, uh, the time to get it back going again. And now we're going to do something. We changed the name to Community Hoops. Uh, and now uh, we're going to get back into that community um, and offer a camp every summer and, uh, and low-cost clinics. Uh, and the goal would be, you know, for the kids, skill clinics. Uh, but also I'd like to, I think something missing is uh, we'd, we'd like to do youth coaching clinics, like go to youth uh, organizations and offer clinics to those coaches and provide them with resources and a place to kind of go. Uh, but I think the thing that's missing, I, I think there's tons of basketball information out there, but I think the thing that's missing is, is, is the low cost part. Like everybody's trying to make money off this. I, I could care less. Like I've had too many people invest in me for free. Um, you know, and so I want to, uh, I want to give back and we could, we got an, a good core of people that are going to be joining us to do that. So, um, one other thing that I do is uh, on Facebook, I, I know that you've joined, uh, run the Austin basketball coaches group. Uh, and so I'm hoping to get a lot of those coaches yeah. uh, involved as well. Yeah, uh, uh, that's awesome. And, and it just speaks to me so much on a personal level as somebody who who's taught and coached only in like a low SES environment for eight years. Uh, they're, they're, they're great kids. They're oh, yeah. just phenomenal kids. And oftentimes it's either that they're just in, in situations that, that put them at a disadvantage and, and, and there's just that need for structure. That's something that you emphasize that if you have that passion to, to put those structures and put those things in place, you'll be amazed and you can speak to this you'll just be amazed at how much your kids will rise to that once that structure is put in place mm -hmm. and I, I will say having taught at every ses level um mm -hmm. i think it's true of of most situations i think every kid every family has something that they struggle with yep um and i think that it's just figuring out what that is and then trying to impact them in that way you know and some of them need a more hands-off approach, you know, and, and they just need you to model it, uh, you know, model what it's like to be, you know, good character, good integrity, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. good discipline. Um, others need a more hands-on approach and they need somebody there that's going to, going to actually, um, you know, hold their hand. Uh, what, what was that that John Wooden said? Um, you know, all kids need a pat on the back, some a little lower. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Think about that. Right. Well, it, it, it all ties back to something that, that, that we talk about all the time. It's just about building relationships and just knowing your players and knowing them as people and just knowing what they need and knowing what's going to work for them. And, and just there's so many things that you can 
do once you know your kids and once you know where they're at and what they're going through and what they need. Uh, it'll, it'll just, it just goes so far beyond basketball. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's get into basketball now. Uh, let's, let's get into your role as an, an, an assistant coach and, and being an effective assistant coach. Now, there are so many different roles and responsibilities that assistant coaches have and perform throughout, throughout the country and world. It, it's, it's like there's no one size fits all or like one rule fits all for, for assistant coaches. So let's talk about yours. What, what kind of what are your roles and responsibilities primarily? How have they changed? But also what has kind of remained consistent? I know you've worked under a couple coaches as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've been blessed in a lot of ways. Um, I've worked under five different head coaches uh, for, and each one, there's a reason that, um, you know, and so um, I've learned a lot along the way. Um, There are some things I think that have stayed the same. Uh, The number one rule for me is that my job is to support the vision of the head coach. And uh, I do not ever want to put them in a situation where it's me versus them. Um, Like I, even if I don't necessarily agree with everything, nobody should ever know that except for the head coach. Yep. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and, and so loyalty is key. And if, um, if I can't work for the person because I so disagree with the problem or with, I'm sorry, with what, what they're doing, yeah. uh, I need to find someone else to work for because it just will not work unless you, fully support the vision and by fully i mean there's obviously always going to be disagreement you would run things your own way which would be different but you have to at least agree enough that you can buy into it and have a unified front uh the other thing that i think is true and this is especially true considering the journey i've been on and working with the different coaches they all have different styles different personalities different approaches um i think you need to be a problem solver Uh, I think you need to look at the situation and say, what needs to be done here? And I think one thing you need to be sensitive to is, like we said, you know, learning the person and and developing relationships. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you do not become bigger or try to make yourself bigger than the head coach. So, like, if you see a problem, you cannot, uh, you know, jump in to get the credit you've got to be behind the scenes and you've got to be okay with the fact that a lot of times it's your work or your ideas that the head coach is getting credit for and you have to be okay with that because as being part of a team like you know that kid on the team that you love to have that that does all the dirty work you know he dies on the floor he gets all the boards he defends the post like crazy plays so hard never is he recognized? But yet we win because of him, you know, like, and, and that's kind of your job as an assistant coach is to be that guy. Um, and I think that it pays dividends because you get a lot of, there's a lot that you get from doing those things, a lot that you learn um, mm-hmm. along the way. And I think people that know will notice, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, but you can't, you can't go out there making yourself bigger than your head coach. Um, so I think that those are some of the, like the, the things that have been universal. Um, but like I said, every, every situation I've been in has been different. Yeah. For example, at O'Connell, I came as a volunteer assistant. Like my job was to just do the laundry, you know, like whatever, <laughs> whatever they needed. And it was a unique situation. I mean, that program is such a high level program. Right. Two coaches in that program went off to the college ranks, like, like division one college ranks. Yeah. Um, one yeah. went to for, for Villanova, you know, like, wow, yeah. um, and so next thing you know, there are holes in the coaching staff. I happen to be there and I go from like an assistant volunteer freshman coach to the head freshman coach with no assistant and the assistant JV coach and the way they run it. Every program is different. Like freshman JV varsity, they're all different and they, they're, they're, they go together, but they are run right. separately. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, my job was still to learn, but the learning curve was ridiculously st- st- uh, steep there and just to hold on for dear life. And not <laughs> And the biggest role I had there was trying because that program up there, they recruit. It's a private institution and they okay. recruit. Yeah. Um, 
you know, uh, my job, because a lot of these freshman kids, really all of them had tried out. They just went to the school and they tried out. And my goal was to try to get it, keep as many of them in the program the next year as I could. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I was moderately successful because two of those kids made it to sophomore year. That's awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that was O'Connell. And then Henderson, I volunteer, um, and that was my, my year right after Bulldog basketball at uh, the elementary school. Mm-hmm. My job was to do the laundry, and I did the best damn job of the laundry I could possibly, like every day it was folded ready. <laughs> um, I, did, I did stats. Uh, I set up the gym. I was the first one there. I set up the gym. I cleaned up the gym after it was done, and occasionally I was allowed to speak. And uh, it was a year of humbling. And especially, you know, after having run the nonprofit for five, six years, uh, yeah. I went from leader to serving. And uh, that was really good for me. Um, yeah. And then yeah. the next year I got the job uh, as a head assistant. And that head coach kind of had his system down. And my job was to be a sounding board. Um, he let me put in some blobs. Um, and I coached a freshman team. And that was, that was basically my role, to be yeah. there, work with the kids. and uh, the to, um, to uh, share his vision. Yeah. Um, and then Austin High, you know, I've worked for two different coaches here. Um, I'm going to speak mainly about Coach Ingram, who's our current head coach. Um, I've worked with him for four years. And um, this has been a great experience because now I've worked for the same man for four years, and we've really developed a strong bond, a strong relationship. Um, and so what I found is, um, you know, my role has increased every year as his trust in me has increased. Yeah. Um, and so uh, my roles there or now are to make suggestions. Um, and I think this is an important point as an assistant coach. If, you, if your head coach takes one out of five of your suggestions, you're batting like 200, the Mendoza line, yeah. uh, you're doing really well. Um, you know, it, it's the head coach's program and they're the ones that are the face of it. And they're the decision makers. And so you have to be okay with the fact that you might have a very clear, concise, excellent point that fits your personality. Perfect. But if it doesn't fit the coach's vision that he's going to say no, and you've got to be okay with that. And yeah. um, if it's something that you truly believe that's going to be the, for the best of the program, you might need to keep fighting and keep pushing it. Um, but, uh, you also have to be okay with no. Right. And, um, so that's really important. Um, another role I have is I coach the JV team. Um, and that's an important role in our program because the way our program is structured, um, JV and varsity practice together. And, okay. uh, in my four years working for coach Ingram, I've probably had five practices where I led the JV team in a practice. Um, okay. so, um, but if you were to ask coach Ingram, what my role is with JV, uh, he'll tell you it's twofold. I'm supposed to develop the kids and I'm supposed to win. And so, um, you know, it, it, it has really helped me. And this is one of the benefits of being an assistant. I've had to be really creative in my approach and I've had to be really good with my time management, really good with how I can coach on the fly how if a coach gives me five minutes to teach man-to-man defense, like I've got to be clear, concise to the point we're in it, we're doing what, what it is we need to do. And then I've got to have a progression where the next time I get five minutes, I build on that. And then the next time I get five minutes, I build on that. And then when we, you know, we're oftentimes the, uh, the dummies, practice dummies for varsity. So now I'm emphasizing in live action and pulling kids and having them stand under the hoop and showing them where they're supposed to be. And it, you know, so, uh, you know, and it's just the nature of the beast with us because it's gym time and it's, it's just, you know, our time and all that, you know, I mean, no coach has ever been fired, you know, based on their JV record, (laughs) you know, but my job is also to prepare them for varsity. Yeah. So that's a really important thing. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of just like individual things that I do, uh, on the court, coach put me in charge of the warmups. Uh, I'm in charge of player development for either posts or guards, and it depends on the year uh, and what we're running and who's in the program, kind of where he wants me on that. Um, at the JV level is a big year for us in our program because uh, I think 
one of my expertise is man-to-man -man defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, as I mentioned, like that's when we have time, that's what I teach. Um, and so uh, you know, my job is to put that in, in, in the JV level. Uh, and and um, it's a little bit different. Coach, you know, like I said, coach gives me a, some freedom. And it's been really great um, to do that because I'm a pressure guy. I'm an up-the-line yeah, pressure, yeah. old school. Yeah. Like I said, Coach Wooten, like that's, that's what we, I learned. And uh, Coach is a little bit more conservative, but I think it's easier to go from pressure to conservative than to go from conservative to pressure. Right, kind of turn it and, down yeah, versus yeah. turning it up, yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we've been able to uh, make that work. Yeah. And then in practice, and this is, again, like we talked about, humbling yourself a little bit. Um, one of my jobs is to see things and then tell the head coach that I see things and then let the head coach make the correction. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, again, it can be humbling. Now, there are times, I'm pretty fiery, and there are times where I stop things. Uh, but for the most part, I want him to be able to do it his way. And a lot, you know, a lot of times he takes them and sometimes he doesn't. And, you know, that's just kind of the way that goes. Right. Well, I, I like uh, that, that you mentioned about the kind of being on the fly and being creative because that is so true. And, and, and cause I, I've been through that before where you go in through a practice and then it's like, all right, coach, uh, just five minutes go and like run through, you know, so-and-so or X, Y, and Z. And it's like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, you're, you're jumping in and all right, this is, this is it. Like I'm, I'm doing this right now. And, and that's so true that you have to be kind of like ready at a moment's notice if, if you're being asked to do something because, because your role and your responsibility just in a practice or in that day to day, it, it might change a little bit. So I'm glad you mentioned that up, mentioned that. And it's also funny. I wrote down, uh, the term unified front before you even said it. So we're thinking along the same wavelength. And I think that that's really true that the players need to see the coaching staff as like a unified front with, with at least, I mean, maybe completely to have like a message, a unified message and everybody's on the same page. And so I wanted to ask you about that. Have, have you found that when you speak as an assistant coach to your players, maybe even if it is somebody at, at a varsity level, that it's treated the same way as if it was any other coach? Because I know some assistants worry that their voice isn't going to be heard or taken seriously as much as maybe like the varsity coaches. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think that it is, huh, how do I put this? It, it, it's kid to kid. Um, I mean, I think being a head coach has a level of authority to it. Being an assistant coach maybe doesn't carry that same weight with certain kids because ultimately the head coach decides playing time. And as a coach once told me, everything comes back to playing time. Uh, you know, and I don't know if that's 100% true, but uh, I mean, <laughs> it definitely is close. Okay. Um, with that being said, um, you know, if I coach them at JV, and I, I don't coach every kid. Some kids make the jump from freshman to varsity. But if I coach them at JV, there tends to be a mutual respect there. Uh, and they oftentimes will seek me out, you know, to get my opinion on things, you know. And I'm kind of the in, in, in between. If I didn't coach them, and they were one of the kids that came in uh, that's a stud, if you will, you know, a basketball player that just could, you know, he's a varsity kid. It depends. And those are the ones I think I struggle with most um, because, uh, you know, they come in with all these accolades and everybody's telling them that they're a baller. Um, and I'm trying to teach them the game. Well, they already know the game, right? They're already ballers. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not, I'm, I'm stereotyping, but, the, and no, it's no, not, I but I mean, and I think as an assistant coach, we have to really work hard to try to reach out to those kids in a way that doesn't, challenge their baller status um you know it doesn't make them because there's there's a delicate ego that teenagers have you know and if you like go at them and they think you know everything that they're in their world is built on them being such a great basketball player and you tell them they're not for a moment and they did something wrong sometimes those kids struggle with that and yeah. especially as an assistant coach yeah. um and so I just think it, it, what you said goes back to relationships. I think it goes back to trying to build a strong foundation with those kids. Um, and then also knowing your stuff. Like if you aren't on the same page with the head coach and they come to you and you don't have 
an answer or a way of finding the answer, then they're not going to come to you and they're not going to respect you. But if you're telling them stuff that's actually going to improve their game and going to make them better, and then once it works, smile at them. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of get this bond, you know, like, hey, he actually did something that helped me, you know, and I think over time that can that can uh, really be a good thing. And I, I think, you know, it has a lot to do with personality too. Uh, the way Coach Ingram is, he is a really uh, mild-mannered, um, doesn't oftentimes raise his voice. Um, you know, uh, he's very calm, which is a really great thing as a coach. Yeah. It's not my style. I'm on fire. And, uh, uh, yeah. and so sometimes some of those kids, especially that never played for me, uh, can struggle with that a little bit. Right. Um, so, it, it, but you know, if it was the reverse role, you know, if I was the calm one, then maybe it'd be a different situation. So I, I think it really comes, I hope, I hope I'm being clear, but I think it comes down to personalities and relationships and each individual thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then also on our end as assistant coaches, we got to know our stuff. We really have to know our stuff and we have to be able to provide information to those varsity players who are going to be playing on Friday nights in front of the big crowds, something that's going to make them better. Yeah. If we don't, then we, they won't, we won't have their respect. And then you run into that situation that you're talking about there. That's, that's really true that, that you have to make sure that you can bring something or you can bring some insight. If a player comes to you, uh, that, that you know your stuff inside and out and that you can explain the game as well. I, I think that that's really true. And something that I've, tried to do and i'm getting better at but anytime i work under somebody as I, as I think to myself is there a way that i could explain this differently in case a kid didn't understand it and mm -hmm. i think that that's that kind of goes with what you said is that you know when i'm coaching i know that there's some things that i say and my girls like will look at me but then another coach would be like this is what he meant i'm like oh okay that makes sense yeah. but then i have to be able to do the same thing where if another coach says something and a couple of the girls are like really confused i have to be able to explain it differently and i think that that's something that you that you brought up that's so true and then like you said it comes down to relationships and trust and i i think you bring up a good point in that so many uh, so many kids it seems like uh maybe have been you know kind of puffed up and, and and have this really great confidence in themselves which is awesome but then you still are teaching them there's still stuff that they need to be taught and there's still holes that need to be shored up and that if they trust you and they know that you care about them you probably are going to have a lot more success being able to do that and I, I think that's something you've kind of reiterated over and over which is great if i if i can add to that um one thing that i have found that has worked pretty well um, if I'm not getting through to a kid is yeah. with huddle it's made it really easy <clears throat> to break down film and uh, so one thing I will do and I think so you know you know teenagers and teenagers are not ones to be like oh thank you coach Edwards I really appreciate <laughs> her. like you know they're they're oh, and then again I'm stereotyping but a lot of them are really cool and maybe they don't understand yeah. this later until later you know and when they're yeah. third I get that call you know but uh, <laughs> but they know if you care. And so if I spend an hour and a half breaking down film and I create a film, a teaching film for an individual player and I pull them in at lunch and I show them what I'm talking about and I show them how that's gonna improve their game in the film, not in front of anybody else, but just me and this individual, um, I think that as much as they hate seeing themselves making mistakes on film, I think that that builds trust and I think that that tells them that, that you care. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things about Huddle is, especially if you let them know, I, I would highly recommend you let them know first, but you can email them the video. Mm -hmm. And then they can look at it on their own, and then they can make comments on it too. And you can go back and forth that way too, especially now that we're virtual. Um, you know, so that's something that has helped with some of those tougher you know, cases in terms of building the relationship. Um, that's just one thing that I found really effective. Uh, I, I love it because I think kids are so much more comfortable, whether it's in the classroom or when they're playing their sport, they're so much more comfortable making mistakes in a safe environment. And sometimes that safe environment might be individual away from everybody else where it's just you and that player just going over it where they don't feel like they're being called out. They don't feel like they're, you know, 
having their mistakes broadcast to everybody and then they feel safe and, and then they feel comfortable with you and, and you'll get so much more, I think, out of it when, when kids are in an environment kind of like the one that you're talking about where, where they feel comfortable making mistakes or having their mistakes explained to them. So yeah, I think that's awesome. So let's, let's now shift into the, to the coaching side of this. So the, the first part of this that I'm curious about, because you've worked under, I think you said five, yep. uh, five different head coaches is for head coaches who are maybe taking a new job or ready to take over a program and they're ready to like, they're, they're going to leave their mark, you know, they're going to blow everything up and they're going to, you know, leave their impression and, and, and change everything uh, about the program. What has that experience been like with the transition where are, are coaches looking at you as like a, a, a valued like expert and kind of historian of the program that can bring in good ideas that were already implemented? Uh, how does that conversation work in terms of like the transition as a new coach comes in? Yeah. Um, so I've only been part of that experience once. Uh, okay. It's in my current role. Uh, the head coach that hired me, um, you know, for one reason or the other was not going to be back the next year. Mm -hmm. Um, and on that entire coaching staff, I was the only one that was, was, uh, retained. And, um, I went for the position. Like I actually went for the head coaching job. I interviewed for it. Uh, I was one of the finalists for it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that could create a real, a lot of animosity, I think when I, you know, when I didn't get it. Um, but I liked the school. Yeah. I'd only been there a year. You know, my journey had taken me year to year to year to year, different places. And I wanted to have like, um, you know, some like kind of an anchor yeah. in my career in terms of high school coaching. Um, and the coach that they hired was somebody that I, I knew not well, uh, but he had a good reputation. He'd been a head coach before for a number of years. Um, he's in the district mm -hmm. and everything I've heard about him was good. And um, the first thing I did was I asked my principal before I even went for the job, uh, you know, like, if I don't get this job, will I still have a job? <laughs> yeah. And they, yeah. you know, assured me that I would. Um, and so that was just my mentality going in is, okay, I'm, I got this opportunity, I'm going to try and I didn't get it. And so now the, the head coach comes in. Um, and my approach was it's his program and right. i was i gave him some ideas i kind of let him know some of the lay of the land uh but one thing i have learned just going from place to place and, and being a teacher you know you get a new kid in your class or whatever yep. if you listen to the previous teacher uh, that really i mean they can give you some good insight but their opinion of a kid or of, of a situation oftentimes is off the mark because they have a different personality than you do Yep. Um, so I tried really hard to not give too many opinions about the state of things. Mm -hmm. um, if he had a question, I would answer it honestly. Um, but I wanted him to get his, make his mark on the program. And again, you know, my job as an assistant w uh, is to be loyal and to, uh, you know, back up and support the vision of the head coach. And I think that that's the most important thing. Um, and so, and, and I know because of the situation that what was going on and, and nothing bad, but yeah, just yeah, yeah. they wanted, they wanted something, they wanted a change. And so me spouting out about everything that had been going on, isn't going to help with the change. Like he needs to implement his program. Um, and so I just started supporting him from there. And as I said, you know, over the last four years, we've become great friends. Um, you know, I consider him a mentor to me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been really good just because, you know, I just, I listened, yeah. I listened to what he wanted. I, I answered questions, like I said, honestly, and, um, and we've rolled from there. Yeah. Uh, well, you bring up a great point in that, you know, when there's change that's being made, um, if it's a situation where like a coach isn't being retained and then a new coach is coming in, like they're you know, put it bluntly, you know, there's a reason why that previous coach wasn't retained. And so there were things that the program wants to change. And so, like you said, if you kind of harp on some of the things of how it used to be done, well, 
those those are the things that are being asked to be changed <laughs> so you, you bring up a good point and that you're there to kind of support the vision of that new coach and, and to also like to make them feel comfortable in that transition to make them feel welcome and, and it probably could create an environment where a new coach coming in might not feel welcome or might not feel appreciated if they constantly hear about oh well this is how we used to do things this is how we've always done things and then they might not feel that it's even their program anymore if, if that makes sense absolutely and I, I think you know the thing that while you're talking there that popped into my head was uh you know at the at the you know how coaches put up all those motivational signs all over the locker room and all that yeah. right yep yep i've heard i've never been but i've heard that in the new england patriots uh facility there's only one sign up it says do your job mm -hmm. and um you know my job when i was not offered the position of head coach my job was assistant is assistant coach and so my job is not to be the head coach um, mm -hmm. I, I need to do my job and i think that in that situation there can be a lot of animosity and and i think a lot of co assistant coaches might leave that situation yeah because of ego or pride or whatever maybe they don't think they can work with the next head coach whatever it might be mm -hmm. but for me it's just been a, a blessing uh because he coach ingram has really um filled in a lot of the holes in my coaching that I know that I have. Um, you know, he's an offensive guru. I mean, his X's and O's are out of this world. Um, and I'm a defensive guy. And so it's been like, had I left, I might have missed that chunk that has really forced me to concentrate on offense more and learn yeah. more. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a good situation. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, th there's so much that you can learn from from being an assistant and just from seeing all the all the different styles and all the different things that like a different coach can bring in and, and kind of fill in some gaps or some holes and sometimes fill in holes that you didn't even know existed until you see somebody else do it you're like whoa like i did not know this nearly as well as i thought i did mm -hmm. so yeah there, there's there's a lot of benefit to that absolutely and so i want to go back to something you mentioned previously and you mentioned about how you might present five ideas and then one of them might might be taken and that might be the one that that that's used is there a point and I, this is kind of more of a hypothetical situation um is there a point where a coach is just not getting a uh, assistant coach is just not getting through to a head coach with their ideas is there like a certain breaking point to where this relationship is fractured and it's time to move on versus no this is just what being an assistant coach is and this is how it usually goes i know every situation is different i'm kind of talking about it hypothetically but i'm just curious about your input on that i mean it depends how strongly you believe in whatever it is you're presenting i mean i think if it if it's a situation where it comes down to morals or ethics or integrity or character um, you don't want your name associated with something that you don't want your name associated with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard of situations at the college level um, where coaches have been doing things that are unethical and assistants have, have left because they did not want their careers tarnished by that. Um, but let's say that the majority of coaches are not unethical, right? Um, so uh for that i mean would i leave a job because the head coach is a zone coach and i'm a man-to-man -man coach i mean i i think so one of the one of the blessings i've had i spent three summers working bob hurley's camp and great, uh, yeah. and i mean he's my hero uh you know coach Wooten is the best bob hurley will tell you that uh, but in terms of just the whole total package like bob hurley is is the cream of the crop in my opinion and uh, i asked him one time um you know like so let me let me say this he came down to our coaches clinic here in texas and presented and the next morning now i had already worked his camp so i knew who i was the next morning we're having like he was in the gym because he was one of the top speakers and then the next day we're in the conference room where you know like the not bob hurley's are talking <laughs> uh, and I'm sitting there and he comes and puts his hand on my back. He says, this seat taken. And I said, no, absolutely not. You can have my seat if you want, right? And, uh, and he sits down next to me and he stayed the entire day. And he's listening to like high school coaches and, you know, uh, all these coaches. 
and he's taking as many notes as I am. And he's talking hoops with everybody around him. And, and I'm th thinking, this is one of the best to ever do it, right? And I asked him, I said, like, what? Like, you already know all this stuff. Like, what are you doing? He's like, look, even if I'd never use this stuff, maybe someday we play a coach that is going to use this stuff. And I will understand it better. And I'll be a more effective game planner because yeah. I was here and I listened to this. And so I think uh, to answer your question, it's a long way to get to it. But to uh, answer your question, I mean, like, if, uh, if you're working for a coach that has a different system than you, learn that system because you never know what's going to happen next. And even if you choose to never learn that or do that system with like in your own program, when you get a head coaching job, uh, you understand that system. So now if you ever play anybody that runs it, your game plan is going to be 10 times more effective. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that I would ever leave over that. Um, you know, I, there are things with coaching room. I have been pushing hard for four years and I, you know, now it's kind of like, jabs and jokes and stuff you know but uh yeah. sometimes the answer is no and you just got to deal with that you know mm -hmm. you got to be okay with that and you know the only way i would leave is if a better position opened up a better position for me and my family um or if i felt like there was an, an ethical reason to leave or if you know there's other things that come up money you know if some people you know worry about their salaries or or teaching position or teaching load. And there are other things, mm -hmm. but I don't think you necessarily leave most of the time over a disagreement on what, what defense or offense to run. I, I, I like that you mentioned about like things about like ethics and morals and integrity. Like I'm, I hope that every, everyone who, who's listening or every coach has like that, that moral or, ethical standard that they're not willing to compromise on no matter what you know situation they're in and, and that's so true but you you also mentioned a great point too about if, if a coach is you know uh, like a, a zone coach and you couldn't care less about zone well I, I guarantee you're going to be playing against teams who are running zones so use it as a learning experience use it as a learning opportunity and you know if you feel um, I'm just kind of thinking ahead if, if you feel that passionately like against like a, a zone defense then when it's being taught and, and your team is doing it you should be in your mind just thinking about all the ways that, that you would be able to beat it not that you're going to change it but in your mind like okay well if I play this I would do this 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 and you're using it as a learning opportunity and, and I think you also mentioned a really good point about like what what is your goal as an assistant coach are, are you happy to be at the school and that that's what matters the most to you are you using it to kind of spring yourself into any sort of head coaching job i i think your your mindset is, is also important and it sounds to me from just from talking to you that you're very happy right now with where you're at and and you don't have like one foot out the door which i definitely think can kind of change an assistant coach's experience Oh, and, and, you know, it's interesting you say that. Um, it's been a growth process. Uh, I want to be a head coach. I mean, that is my, my professional goal yep. is to run my own program. Yep. And there are times, I will, I will admit, where that has gotten in the way of my judgment and my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people who are very ambitious and want to make that jump to being a head coach need to be very cognizant of that, very aware of that. Um, and thankfully my head coach is patient and he cares. And like I said, we're great friends. And so he's really helped me grow in that regard, you know, and without ever saying it, I, like I said, like in my head, I'm thinking, do my job, mm -hmm. do my job. I'm going to do great at my job. Um, and then when the opportunity presents itself, I will be ready. And, um, you know, it's the same thing you say to your players, right? prepare yourself when my moment comes, I'll be ready. And, yeah. uh, and uh, so I think thinking like a head coach is really important. Yep. I think thinking what would I do if I'm a head coach is really important, but understanding that my, I have to do my job first. Yeah. Ab yeah, absolutely. Lo love the quote about do your job. And, and one that I, I try to live by is, is be where you are, like wherever it is you are, like you need to be there. Like I think your players 
will kind of recognize if you're sort of like checked out or you're sort of like not there and you're not all in and invested. And it's something great to remember is that the kids in that program, they're, they're there, like they are invested, they're all in and, and they deserve to have a coaching staff that is just as all in and just as laser focused and just as committed to them as the players are to their own success. I think it's only natural that, that, that relationship kind of goes both ways. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk about that, that kind of that younger, that newer coach who's like ready, they're, they're ready to jump in and they're like, oh, I want to be a head coach. I'm, 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 I'm ready. Like, here we go. Like, let's make this happen. And they're ready to jump into it and it doesn't, and it doesn't really work out. And, and, and they're going for in a, and then they get an assistant job. They go for, and they get an assistant job. And let's say like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm an assistant. Like, you know, this isn't really what I wanted. What are the benefits that a new coach can get from starting as an assistant rather than just brand new jumping in and, and running the ship themselves? Well, I mean, being a head coach is an enormous job if you want to do it right, um, if you want to create a program and not just coach a team. And uh, it's such a huge job that uh, I think I've seen co head coaches, young head coaches in my career who have done that. They've, you know, being, becoming a head coach is really hard. Like just getting that first job is really yeah. hard. The number one prerequisite for being a head coach is head coaching experience. <laughs> and, and so, you know, like, that's really been a struggle for me. Uh, you know, like, I get maybe get an interview, but I lose it to somebody who has head coaching experience. Well, uh, how yeah. am I ever going to get a <laughs> Catch 22. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, there are some sports in particular in Texas where they're struggling to find head coaches. And so I see at our school and at other schools, head coaches that come in straight out of college, maybe they played the sport, whatever. And they try to become a, a head coach right away. They get the job because, you know, there was they were the best candidate. Maybe there was only two, and they were the best. And, yeah, yeah. and then, uh, then they really struggle. And the learning curve is so steep. It's like me at Bishop O'Connell only, you know, as an assistant coach, you're protected, uh, you know, in a lot of ways. Because you don't make many decisions. And as long as you don't do anything stupid – and you're somewhat competent, and you're, you're loyal to your head coach, and the kids like you, you'll be fine. Uh, you know, you can, you can make a career out of that and never look to, you know, advance or anything. But um, like I said, I've seen a lot of, of people jump into that head coaching role that are just like, it's overwhelming. It is overwhelming. You really have to understand how to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I think the benefit is that everybody needs a mentor. I think, and I think you, you need to seek one out. Um, you know, I think when you're looking to become an assistant coach, you ought to seek out a coach to work for that is well-respected and that you're going to learn a lot from and is interested in helping you. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and as I was saying, I always want to talk a little bit more about that protection thing. Um, as I said earlier, uh, no JV coach has ever been fired because, or sorry, no varsity coach has ever been fired because of their JV record. And everything comes back to playing time. And as an assistant coach, you don't assign playing time to the varsity team. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that that is a huge responsibility because of all the politics and things that go into it in terms of uh, what do you do when you have the superintendent's kid on your team? What do you do when, you know, the, the biggest donor to the school's kid is on your team and they, maybe they're not as good as some of the other players. Like there's a lot of decisions that go into it that you would think are cut and dry, but they're not. Uh, you know, the school board has a lot of power over your position. And if they have a friend who has a kid, you know, and so these are the kind of things that assistant coaches might not think about. Mm -hmm. But in being an assistant coach, you see that. And you can have, if there's trust with your head coach, you can have that discussion with the head coach. What is your thought process with this situation? How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with this kid who is possibly a cancer to our program, mm. but yet their parents are very strongly politically connected and they're ruining the season for the team and for the program. Like, right. And if you cut them, 
that might be the end of your job. Like there's, there's so many of those situations and, and it's not, you know, all doom and gloom. It's not like that every oh, yeah. year, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the head coach has to make those decisions. And I think as an inexperienced coach, that hasn't been through the ringer a few times. Mm-hmm. You don't know what to do in those situations. And mm-hmm. I think being an assistant coach, you, uh, you have a mentor and you might, the answer might be, I'm never doing it that way. <laughs> that my yeah, head coach yeah, did yeah. It. Yep. But you yep. at least learned a valuable lesson there. So mm-hmm. that, you know, and it's just like teaching. And I've been teaching 19 years. And now it, most situations I've seen before, but every year there are two or three new ones. Yeah. That you've got to deal with. Especially recently. <laughs> yeah. oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you've got, to, you've got to expand your bag of tricks. And I think working for somebody lets you opens up their bag of tricks to you. And you can see how they handle those things. Uh, one of the things that I do um, as an assistant coach, I've always done is I've made it known to the head coach that I want to be a head coach and that I want to be involved in everything that they will allow me to be involved in. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to paperwork, my head coach is great about calling me into the office and we do it together. When it comes to ordering buses, when it comes to ordering food, when it comes to scheduling referees, when we have a parents meeting, uh, because there's an angry parent, I'm in the room. Usually I'm taking notes. Um, you know, when it comes to a meeting with the principal about something, uh, the, the district meetings, the, uh, when we decide who, you know, the pre-district meeting and the post-district meeting, Mm -hmm. like all of those things, I'm there. And, uh, and my head coach thankfully wants me there. And then we just, then we talk about it. This is preparing me for a head coaching job. And, uh, if I was, just a head coach, I'd be going to those meetings with a lot of questions and I don't know where I'd turn. Like yeah. you, your, your competition and say, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, because they might not tell you the right answer. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I think that that's, that's huge. You brought up a really good distinction that I think is really important to reemphasize is that if you become a head coach, you're running a program. You're not necessarily just coaching you are in charge of the basketball program and that goes so far beyond just your practices and your games and there's a lot of responsibilities and you mentioned some great situations that you have to be ready for because you're responsible for the program you're the face of the program like you're the face in public of the program and it's so true that head coaching would be a lot different if all you had to do was show up during practice, show up during games and then do your thing and be done. But there's so much more involved to it that it could just completely overwhelm a new coach who just isn't aware of that. They may have the best X's and O's in the world, but they're not ready to handle talking to the community and talking to parents and all this other stuff. Like it's a huge part of the job. So, so that, that's great that that was emphasized. And you mentioned too, which, was also I think really good to to keep in mind is that you made it very clear about your goals you made it very clear about what you're ultimately trying to do and I think for a coach uh, a head coach they should know the career goals that their assistants have like what where are they trying to get to Are, are they going for a head job are they happy just being an assistant are they, you know, are they retired? And this is just like, they're, they were a head coach, but now they're perfectly good with, with doing this and understanding what, what they're at, because I think everybody's goals are a little bit different. And so with that, let's just say that that new coach comes in, brand new. What would be, if there's something that comes to mind, like on the top of your mind, what, what would be the number one most effective thing that a brand new head coach could do to make sure that they're like using their assistants the right way? Comes down to communication. Talk to them. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who took over a program um, and he was told that he had to retain his assistants. And the, one of the assistants had gone for the head coaching position and wasn't very happy that he didn't get it. Yeah. Um, they had very strong opinions about what should be done and they, and it was a difficult situation he was walking into. Mm-hmm. And what he told me, and I think that this is fantastic advice, is before he did anything, he called him. And then individually, they, he took him out to, to, to lunch. And he brought a notebook. And he had a series of questions. And he just asked the questions and listened and took notes. 
and didn't try to at all try to uh, to push his agenda yet. He wanted to get it all out. He wanted to know where these people were. And, um, you know, I think something that I would definitely appreciate a head coach asking me is, what can I do for you? I think that that builds a lot of trust, you know. And, uh, you know, when you are – so I think that, again, having taught for so many years and coached, I think leading adults is harder than leading kids. Yeah. And so when you're a head coach and you're trying to lead your staff, um, I think you have to build, you have to be intentional about building trust with them so that they trust your judgment. And then you actions speak louder than words. I think you have to show them that you mean what you say and that you are for them. Yeah. Um, and that could mean that you have, you funnel through a lot of assistant coaches. Wouldn't that be an awesome thing? If your assistant coaches kept getting head jobs, mm -hmm. you're going to get some really good assistant coaches along the way because you have a reputation now. Um, but I think that you just have to, you have to listen to them. And again, I think there is a way to say no, that's respectful. And I think as a head coach, I've been told as an assistant coach, I've been told no so many times by my head coach, but yet I, I, I respect it. And I, and, and as Pete Newell will say, or said all the time, players have to know the why. I think anybody you lead has to know the why. And if you have a definite reason for what you're saying as a head coach, I think that assistant coaches, if you have the right people, will listen and respect that even if they disagree. Right. Uh, but back to that, I mean, and again, I quote a lot of coaches because they're a lot smarter than me. Uh, but Morgan Wooten, when asked, um, you know, what is the key to, to uh, building a great program? And he said, the number one rule for building a great program is to hire great people. And he said, I don't even care if they know basketball at the beginning. Like, they'll learn if they're great people. And so uh, I think – as an assistant, try to be a great person, right? And uh, as a head coach, uh, you know, hopefully you have the opportunity to hire your own assistants that you trust and that you, you know are great people. But if you're not, you be a great person yourself and lead by example and show them that you care about them just like you do with your players. You care about their goals and that you care about their opinions uh, and that we're a team. Yeah. Uh, just communication uh, communication is just so important just communicating being open and then just having great people you know I, I always want you know great people who happen to coach basketball or great people who happen to teach and you're you're so true it's the same thing with players too like give me players who are gonna work hard and buy in I, I can teach you the basketball stuff like that's no problem but it's the character and the work ethic and all those things and it's so true that it applies with adults as well. And I also think uh, another good thing about the story you mentioned about talking to those assistant coaches is in a way, it lets that assistant coach kind of get everything out and almost in a sense, like bring closure to what happened before. You just empty, empty the tank and it's like, all right, got it all out. I'm going to process all this. And now we can kind of take that next step forward because oftentimes I feel like when a, a head coach leaves and a new one comes in, uh, those assistant coaches really didn't have much of a time to kind of get get out their feelings or process their thoughts and so making sure as a new head coach that you let your assistants kind of empty that out so that way we can make a, a clean move forward I, I, I think that's an excellent idea mm -hmm. so let's get into uh to wrap up coach this is great let's get into a coaching moment of yours something that's happened in your coaching career that you think other listeners and other coaches would be able to learn from yeah so I had to ask my head coach on this one. Uh, you know, there's so many moments, and I wanted it to be something that, that resonated with your audience. Um, and so I'm going to tell a quick story about a kid. Uh, I, I, for the last five years, I've taught freshman geography. And this kid uh, is in my freshman class, and he'd come to class, and he'd sleep. Uh, he was very disinterested, obviously not a fan of me. Um, not a fan of the structure in my classroom, uh, not a fan of doing work. Um, 
you know, he, he was one of those kids that at the last minute, I'm trying desperately to help him earn a 70. Um, and then he shows up to basketball uh, tryouts. And he had the experience. He played summer ball. Um, but he was, to be honest with you, our final keep on the freshman B team just because of, you know, he, he, he had some skill. Um, and freshman B, maybe two of those to three of those kids make it to JV you know, a year on average. Um, but somehow throughout that season, and he was academically ineligible during that season. So he missed a chunk of that season. But over the summer, he grew a little bit into his body, skills improved a little bit, and he was the last player picked for JV. So now I'm coaching this kid. And it's intense when you're a JV player because, as I said, we, we're, we're the dummies for the varsity. we got to give them a run every single day. And him and I didn't see eye to eye, and it was, it was rough. And uh, I finally – we get into game play. I put him into a game, and he made a couple really nice defensive plays. And they were positional plays because this kid's not an athlete. But he, he understood position. Like, as I taught how to play defense, it clicked with him. And I didn't know that until this game. And so I made a comment to him and his mother after the game. I'll never forget it. I said, like, man, that was great defensive. You really need to focus on defense. This is, could be something. This could be your ticket right here. And his mom took it as I didn't care about his offensive game. So now mom is mad at me. And kid still is not a big fan of me. And so mom wants to have a meeting. And we have this meeting. And she's just, you know, it's about playing time, of course, and it's about, you know, roles and all that. I said, let me talk to your son. And I pulled him into a room and I said, look, I believe in you. I really do. And I saw something in you that I don't see in a lot of players. And I really think that this could be great for you. And if you trust me, like, we can build on this. And I don't know what it was because that, co that conversation doesn't always work. But with this kid, it clicked. And next thing you know, he's listening, he's working hard in practice, he's getting better and better and better. By the end of the year, he's playing. He's not starting, but he's playing. And then the next year comes along, and he was like the last cut for varsity, like he's right there at the end, and he's going to sit the bench. And he told our head coach, I want to play for Coach Edwards at JV again. And I was like shocked that he, I mean, I thought he wanted to get away from me. And so he starts that year and has a phenomenal season, but it was not anything that you'd see in the scorebook. You know, it was just, he was, everybody knew that he knew the game better than anybody out on that court. And then senior year comes along and he didn't start, you know, in varsity, you know, his athleticism kind of held him back a lot. But my, our other assistant coach made a comment every single time that a big play happened or a run happened, he was in the game. Like the whole season when we needed it, he was in the game and that's when something big happened. And, um, and so my point is, even though this kid hated me and I had experience with him, I think we have to give kids the opportunity every single day to show themselves because they're growing and learning too. And especially at that age, they're learning a lot. And if we had given up on this kid, then like now he him and I are close as can be and like he's one of the favorite kids I've ever coached but you would have never thought that had you know and had we given up on him you know I, and I think just unless a kid gives you a reason that you have to give up on him just don't give up on him just keep working keep working and eventually you never know when it's going to click and every once in a while you get one of these and it's it's it changes you it changes them it changes the whole whole program it, it makes it all uh, all worth it and and if you believe and, and you keep working and you treat every day like it's a new day and you just keep keep going at it you you never know what you might find but it's so uh, i'm with you it's so easy to write somebody off or write a kid off and it, it's crazy to think that that it does happen you know writing kids off at 14 like like nothing like that's it you're, you're done but if you believe and you stick with it and and you just keep working with them you never know what can what might happen and then if an instance like that happens like you said it will stick with you and that kid forever and oh, so absolutely. ultimately that's what that's what it's all about that difference that we get to make that, that's great so 
I always give my coaches uh, the, the, the 60 second soapbox to wrap up where they can get out any final thought, idea, reemphasize something that they want. So coach, the floor is yours. Go ahead. I'll try to keep to 60. Um, <laughs> it's okay so, if it goes over. <laughs> okay. Uh, so our clinic this year, TABC clinic uh, was virtual and I got to listen to, to a lot of coaches who maybe wouldn't normally speak. And one of them was Danny Henderson, who's a Texas high school coaching legend. Um, and his, the big takeaway I had was uh, you need as a coach to have a clear and concise philosophy on every single aspect of the game and every single aspect of your coaching. And we're talking about uh, what's your overall coaching philosophy? What's your co philosophy of selection of players? What's your philosophy of the role of an assistant? What's your philosophy of offense, defense, practice philosophy, scheduling philosophy? I mean, you can run the gamut and you need to have it broken down like and and so what my goal has been is this summer to come up with one sentence philosophy for everything I can think of and and then from there come up with like three rules for everything and it has made my thinking so much more clear and concise and then flesh it out a little bit more but um, I think in all my years coaching I've never been so clear and so concise and so uh, uh, I just want to give props out to coach Henderson who I've never met uh, but I think that that's some of the best coaching advice I've gotten in a long time and when I'm done with this project uh, I know that the next time I have a head coaching interview no matter what question comes up I will have a, a, a statement and three quick things that I can mention and I will know them and they'll be what I believe in and that becomes my foundation um, and I can also give them to players if there's ever, I mean, those, that's what I teach to players. This is our program. This is how we do it. Yeah, uh, I love it. Uh, being clear, be, being concise. And if you can present that information in a way that your players can repeat it back to you and they understand it, then like that, that's what it's all about. Because if your players don't understand it, then it doesn't really matter too much how much you understand it as a coach. So I think that's a, that's a phenomenal philosophy. Uh, well, Coach, uh, I, I greatly appreciate this. This was really insightful and really informative and, and really bringing some insight about effective assistant coaching and, and the benefits of being an assistant coach and just all the things that go in and out of it. This, this was a wonderful discussion. I learned a lot from it. Uh, I'm really, really appreciative that you came to talk to us about it. So, so, Coach Edwards, thank you so much for this and good luck this season going forward. Thank you so much. Appreciate you having me. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.